It's a tale as old as time, the battle between good and evil, a dichotomy common to almost every culture on Earth. We almost always appeal to our regional deity to explain the origin of good and evil, but I believe we already come equipped with moral conceptions tattooed on us at birth in the scripture of our DNA. For example, if an ancient religious text was unearthed tomorrow from a long-lost civilization a hundred thousand years ago, containing wisdom and knowledge, shockingly accurate predictions and prophecies, even if it was filled with new discoveries that helped the world, if that text also said that it is okay to murder people, most of us would still feel repelled by this idea. This episode we explore two creeps, one real, Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee cannibal, and the protagonist of the novel Perfume, Perfume the story of a murderer. This is Novel Meets Evil, Scent of a Killer. Killer. Novel Meets Evil is a true crime podcast where we compare literary characters from modern fiction to real cases to see what we can learn about human nature. You think you know your neighbors, your co-workers, your spouse, but the real creeps hide in plain sight every day. What's behind the curtain? What are they hiding? Do you really want to know? And why are you so eager to look? What are you hiding? I'm here to tell you that there's nothing wrong with looking. Just don't stare. It'll give you the creeps. Good is associated with life, Health, generosity, continuity, happiness, love, and justice. Evil is connected to conscious and deliberate harm. Discrimination that harms others. Humiliation of people with the goal of damaging their psychological health and dignity. Destructiveness. And unnecessary violence. It seems to be hardwired into us that good should prevail over evil its opposite. Writers play with hero stories all the way back before the Old Testament as a way of illustrating moral lessons. Pessimism, the dark side, is just as silly as optimism, the light side. And if we're being honest, stories of danger and adventure and murder are compelling because we all feel good and evil within us, light and dark, strength and weakness, gentleness and violence. In fiction, murder mysteries and tales of the macabre appeal to us while tales of the good and righteous just aren't as titillating. We are the same humans who click on the negative story about a celebrity we hate ten times more often than the uplifting article about someone we admire. We rubberneck at traffic accidents but take no notice of two lovers holding hands. It's human Human nature. nature. Advertising and media outlets understand this and make careers off of human nature. Starting in the year 2000, I worked for the D.C. Public Library. When I was working at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library in D.C., I checked out thousands of books to every kind of person out there. I met a lot of people through similar reading interests and got introduced to a lot of work I never would have discovered by myself. There was a guy, clearly homeless, and also clearly a very avid reader. Philosophy, history, art, fiction, everything. I talked to him every time he came into the library about what he'd been reading, and he always had interesting hot takes. I once asked him what was the most disturbing fiction he could recommend that was also really good. Without hesitating, he gave me two titles. The first was The Wasp Factory by Ian Banks. And the second was Perfume, the story of a murderer. I'll call it Perfume from here on. Setting aside the former for a later episode, Perfume was an interesting choice. Why did he find it disturbing, I wondered. He said it was because you experienced the story through the eyes of a downtrodden genius artist who also happens to be pure evil. You don't know whether to root for his success as an artist or cheer for his downfall because of the horrors he unleashes on the world, or at least on France. The book did very well upon its release in Germany and then the rest of the world. 
I bet it would have done even better if it were reworked by Hollywood, simplified down to good triumphs over bad, the Hollywood ending. That's the reason this book is so compelling, though, because it's hard to accept. We prefer a clean dichotomy to a complex mixture of good and evil. But that's what real people are. It may be less sexy, but the author Suskin understands how to tell the story including both aspects in a balanced way. And I'd have to agree with my library patron friend. It is all the more disturbing because of this. A librarian I worked with, an older guy, the classic librarian with a vest and a bow tie, red nose, and he smoked a pipe. I described the book to him and he said, Sounds ambitious, but I wouldn't read it. But hey, say what you will about Hitler, but the guy could work a room like nobody's business. In other words, even villains have their strong points. Can we possibly give props to a person like this, though? Well, in this case, it's only fiction. I approach this episode's novel within this framework. So, for example, let's take two fictional concert pianists competing in a world-class competition. One player is an honest, upstanding person who strives to help people and who scores a 9.5 out of 10 on the judges' scorecards. The next pianist is a mass-murdering rapist who also scores 9.5. How good or evil they are doesn't seem to matter when considering the greatness of their talent. This fact is more than a little disturbing, considering the amount of media, art, and other information we consume blindly from unknown sources. We don't know who they really are. I'm not saying that evil people playing an instrument for our enjoyment will somehow seep into our souls like disease. However, we don't usually see the opposite as true. We've all seen someone performing on stage from a place of peace and joy, and we hope this will be conveyed to the listener and provide a spiritual experience. We know there are good people from whose natural talents we have benefited, but it would be ignorant to deny that similar talent also exists in people seen as wicked. Supervillains, for example, are always more likable than their evil henchmen. There's sort of a charm in their scheming. If we picture a Venn diagram with two fields, good on one side and evil on the other side, within the overlapping area are the uncommonly talented, some with gentle hearts, but also some genuinely shitty people who, if not for their talent, would be swinging at the end of a rope. But we rarely step in to prevent these people from contributing their talents, at least not until their usefulness can be extracted. In other words, even someone from Slytherin should have the ability to acknowledge the talent of Hermione Granger. Similarly, someone from Gryffindor would have to acknowledge the same talent in someone from Slytherin. Regardless of how you judge the person with the talent, the ability is there. The talented devil. That is really the topic of this episode's novel, Patrick Suskin's 1985 novel Perfume. Not the hideous acts of the book's villain, but rather the role of transcendent talent in a tragedy of good and evil. The Science of Smell The power of scent is so primal it is known to conjure up poignant memory, emotion, romance, alarm, sexuality more quickly at a deeper level of consciousness than any other sense. Harvard's Venkatesh Murthy, life sciences professor and chair of the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology says, Smell and memory seem to be so closely linked because of the brain's anatomy. Smells are handled by the olfactory bulb, a structure in the front of the brain that sends information to the other areas of the body's central command for further processing. Odors take direct route to the limbic system, including the amygdala and the hippocampus, the regions related to emotion and memory. The olfactory signals very quickly get to the limbic system. This is all very interesting. However, the novel Perfume is not really about perfume. 
You do get a front row seat to the process of how scents are conjured up in the minds and realized at the hands of craftsmen with finely tuned noses. This all changes when we settle into the life of our protagonist, Jean-Baptiste Grenouille, an oddest of odd ducks with a god-level superpower and the sickest of ambitions. Grenouille was born with a pure talent, the best nose in Paris, possibly the world. He understood the world through olfactory input, and his ability to decode and catalog sense was photographic, beyond the level of inspiration of Mozart and the calculus of Newton. Even if he'd been born blind, his vision of the world would still have been complete, simply through his sense of smell. He could find his way in the dark by smell, follow a scent all the way across town to its source. These were the games he played with himself. Despite having been born into sickening squalor and disease and thrown away like garbage in a rancid pile of fish guts, he survived against all odds into boyhood without any love at all. No sense of purpose, learning only enough language to get by showing no interest in any skill that didn't have to do with smell. Like so many prodigies, his talent was all he had, so that's what he stuck to. And not even perfume, but the odorous characteristics of everyday items. Flowers, sewers, meat markets, silks, herbs, dead rats, brothels, grass, stone, rain. To him, it didn't matter as long as the smell was new. He would wander the gritty streets of Paris with his eyes closed, mapping out a world that no one but him could perceive. These are the perfumes he's after. On a day like any other, Jean-Baptiste picked up a heavenly scent, stopped what he was doing and followed it across the city, through streets, down alleyways, and around corners until the scent became constant. He had identified its source a red-haired girl selling yellow plums. Unlike this natural masterpiece, the finest actual perfumes of Paris bored the child prodigy. He could easily identify and quantify the exact olfactory components of each eau de toilette with just one inhalation. But the natural fragrance of this girl was special and marked the first time Grenouille had ever been overcome with the beauty of, for lack of a better term, a perfume. He sidled up to this girl to get a better sniff, and he surprised her. He covered her mouth and laid down with her, absorbing her scent in a dream world. When he came to, the girl was dead, which wasn't really an inconvenience for him. Now he could smell every part of her body, memorize and catalog every detail. But before long, her fragrance dissipated, and he was grief-stricken. The best thing he had ever had, and it was stolen away in minutes. So perfect and so short-lived was the magical effect of her essence. This experience changed everything. Let those simple-minded aristocrats pay good money for their crude, romantic mixtures. He now knew real art and knew the crusade he would have to undertake. He would learn to extract every odor known to man and create a perfume as perfect and alive as this girl had been. If anyone on earth could pull this off, it would be Jean-Baptiste Grenouille. When he stumbled ass backwards into Paris's professional perfuming world, he was just a lowly delivery boy, bringing glove leather to, as luck would have it, the perfumery of the once famed scent master Giuseppe Baldini. The moment he walked in, he was already capable of creating transcendent perfumes many levels better than those that were ruling the markets across Europe. Indeed, better than anything Baldini had ever conceived of. What he lacked, however, was the tradecraft, the techniques, the process. In the laboratory of this has-been master, Jean-Baptiste learned the names of thousands of ingredients, extracts, essential oils, and how to mix and assemble creams, powders, and pomades to be sold at his master's shop. Before long, Baldini purchased Grenouille from the leather maker he had been working for. Now that Jean-Baptiste was his, 
Baldini taught the boy his own techniques of water distillation over a low heat source, which worked to extract the run-of-the-mill perfuming ingredients, everything most perfumers would ever need. France, like other European countries at this time, was classist, and as Granui was barely better than a slave, the poor wretch had no social standing to even begin the process of becoming a perfumer. So, to repay his master for his education, he casually rattled off a series of next-level perfume recipes, which Baldini would take credit for, and not only did these restore Baldini's brand to the olfactory map, but also spread news of his renewed genius all across Europe. Grenouy couldn't have cared less about the fame and fortune, though. He only cared about one thing, continuing his mastery of preserving scents how to extract the essential essences from every substance known to man, even those undetectable by fine noses like Baldini's. Jean-Baptiste's quest began to annoy his master as he begged Baldini to teach him how to isolate the smells of glass, copper, gravel. Glass has no scent. Gravel has no fragrance, you idiot. One time in a foreshadowing move, Jean-Baptiste decided to extract the pure essence of a puppy dog. It worked. The puppy's life was donated to his experiment, and he carried around a small vial of eau de puppy, sniffing at it occasionally. Red flag? Once Jean-Baptiste knew he had nothing more to learn from Baldini, and having set him up for life, he left Paris in search of even more advanced methods of scent extraction. Baldini had explained to his prodigy that if there was any place on earth one could learn more techniques, it would be in the holy land of the perfuming world, the famed town of Grasse in southern France. So he left. In Grasse, Jean-Baptiste started from the bottom, learning new, more effective methods for extracting scents using animal fat and tallow. He worked his hands to the bone in a flower extractory leaching substances from dying blossoms, learning how the life cycle of a living or recently living organism changes the usable notes over time. This would then have to be refined and filtered, but using this method he discovered new ways of extracting animal smells. Slinking around grass, Grenouille picked up the essence of something reminiscent of the red-haired girl from his past, but even better. It was another red-haired girl, hidden somewhere behind the walls of the residence of the richest man in Grasse, the aristocrat's daughter. As Grenoui had learned, a good perfume contains several layers of scent, not just ingredients, but notes in a great chord that rings in harmony with itself and dies away gracefully. He had learned this craft from Baldini, that the top notes will last 5 to 15 minutes, giving way to the heart notes, 20 to 60 minutes, followed by the bass notes, which lasted six hours or more. It was common practice to include foul odors combined with sweet floral notes, because the only thing that really mattered was the final composition, the chord. Just to entertain himself, Grenoui had regularly incorporated extracts of cat shit or dead animal into fine perfumes. The customer would never know, and that pleased him. His artwork was antisocial personality disorder manifest. He hated humanity, and it showed in his work. In Grasse, Jean-Baptiste gave himself a deadline of two years to collect 24 notes, the smells of the young nubile girls of Grasse, and compose them into a symphony, his own personal museum of specimens. In early experiments, he paid prostitutes to let him wrap them in tallow-soaked cloth and later purify the substances to a concentrated drop or two of oil. But these women weren't comfortable or relaxed, and he knew from his previous experiments with animals that a scared creature will emit hormones of fear and perspiration that sullies the true, pure scent of a woman at rest. Logically, as any psychopath would do, he found himself a club. He knew exactly how to control his own aroma to render himself, if not invisible, undetectable. Twenty-four murders later, the town of Grasse was living in fear, petrified of a phantom who, without being noticed, would slip into bedrooms and take the girls. 
they would be found nude with their hair shorn and well moisturized and lifeless. Grenoui lived unnoticed and unsuspected as he added the final notes to his masterpiece. But suddenly he decided sometimes a perfume needs just one more note to take it from phenomenal to transcendent. This final note resided within the aforementioned aristocrat's walls, and more specifically within his gorgeous auburn-haired daughter. Just like every father in Grasse, this man locked his girl away, going so far as to hide her in a nearby town. But this didn't deter Grenouille, who quietly followed her scent to a nearby village and made his final extraction. The symphony was complete, and now... Grenouille turned himself in. As you would expect, the town authorities are relieved, but they also wanted blood. They sentenced Grenouille to a gruesome public execution, and everyone came to see the imp broken and hung for their pleasure. But they didn't count on one thing. The superpower now contained in a tiny vial hidden on Jean-Baptiste's person. One drop, and his jailers realized he was not a man, he was an angel. They led him to the execution grounds, where, upon inhaling his new perfume, the public, as well as the authorities, declared him innocent of all charges, and actually worthy of love and praise. Another drop, and the whole crowd fell in love, with each other, with everything, with life itself. Long story short, there was a massive orgy involving priests and citizens, soldiers and women, boy on boy, girl on woman, any and every possible combination. When everything was over, Grenouille was gone. In the nearby countryside, Jean-Baptiste came to a sickening realization that his quest, the formulation and execution of his masterpiece, was only half a success. Sure, it rendered him a god to anyone near enough to smell, but these were the people he hated. Filthy, brutal humanity. He thought his feet would be his ultimate source of self-esteem, but he found it a hollow victory. He doused himself with the entire vial of his magical elixir, and completely unable to control their lust for him, the townspeople converged on him like hyenas, tore away his clothes, his skin, tore him limb from limb, and devoured him completely. Thus ends the tragedy of Jean-Baptiste Grenouille, unrivaled prodigy whose work was too good for humankind's understanding, and whose heart was brilliant and evil. If you know any exceptional people, you know they are often surprised when it's pointed out to them. I'm imagining a tragic house fire where a neighbor, a genuinely good person, is lauded as a hero for jumping into the burning building and saving the baby. Well, they didn't even think about it. They didn't mean to do anything heroic. They didn't have to overcome some crippling fear to do it. The flip side of the coin is that the character of Jean-Baptiste never meant to do evil or harm by extracting his ladies any more than a hungry lion wants to do evil by hunting an ibex at a watering hole. It was a natural byproduct of his talent fueled by his ambition. If he could have extracted their sense non-violently, I'm sure he would have been fine with that. Anything to get to the end goal. But if you actually are evil at your roots, then you don't have to intend anything. They act according to their nature, just like the hero does on the light side, and nature, however brutal, takes its course. When a criminal psychopath is presented with his crimes, he's often similarly surprised. Well, I guess when you put it that way, it was wrong to kill all those women. It simply doesn't occur to them, and that is the fascination to glimpse, even if just for a second. This model fits Grenouille to a T, with so many characters noting along the way his innocence and naivete in his daily activities. He didn't know how the world really worked, and people took advantage of this. All he knew was smell, and that's all he was capable of valuing. It even affected the way he learned language, limiting his vocabulary toward the olfactory, away from a well-rounded fluency. It would have served him well to learn everything 
But that was not the mind he was born with, and a mind is not something easily undone. It's unfortunate, but we all know what needs to be done with a mad dog or a tiger who has tasted a human flesh. You take them out back and shoot them in the head. Moving into the evil section of this episode, I am assuming you know who Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer is. He lured young men to his apartment and killed them, but only so he could have someone to lay with. He had grown tired of spooning with mannequins and needed something more realistic, like a real person. He was incapable of finding real love with a real man, so, like Grenouille, he decided that as long as they served his purpose, humans were disposable. They were mere science experiments to these sickos. Dahmer was the boogeyman of my generation, as maybe Manson or Gacy was to the Gen Xers. We all watched the news reports as they unearthed new horrors in his apartment. Suskind, our author, gives an illustration when describing Jean-Baptiste Grenouille that applies easily to Dahmer. Both men are like ticks, going unnoticed and seemingly harmless, but quietly stealing. Dahmer was a hungry tick lodged in the flesh of an apartment building in a rundown section of Milwaukee. Grenouille walked the streets of Paris nursing his own obsession. They were both collectors, collectors of things better than themselves. They could never be good, healthy men. They had nothing to give to society. They could only make their marks on society by what they stole from it. We compare these creeps today on this episode of Novel Meets Evil, episode <laughs> Scent of a Killer. Dahmer was a parasite. He wasn't a cancer that would eventually kill its host, but rather a nuisance on his host, humankind. Of course, once the world learned of his chamber of horrors, we were dumbfounded on virtually every level. The acts themselves, of course, were beyond imagining, but also the flaws in the system that might have made the rest of us a little safer. I remember the Dahmer case being the first time in my life, I was 10 when the story broke, when I considered that we all might be living among people we don't fully know. It gave me the shivers. Many of his neighbors and co-workers said things like, Oh yeah, Jeff? He was a nice guy, just a regular dude. And these words, almost as much as the details of his crimes, scared the daylights out of me. Just a regular dude. So let me get this straight. I can be looking right at someone, but simply not seeing them. Like a phantom, a puff of smoke. In the case of Dahmer, a middling, attractive, kind of loser-looking doofus. The Milwaukee cannibal shouldn't look like that. Because if I accept that, then how do we protect against it? A grinning, gray, nondescript shape just hanging out, not even lurking, in the neighborhood bar. Who is really a King Cobra. My position of male privilege has allowed me to avoid having to think about it, but many women feel this anxiety basically all the time. Yeah, guys can be nice and unassuming and harmless, but you never really know who to trust. And shocking violations of trust happen often enough. It's understandable that women walk around feeling vulnerable. Guys are creeps. Or better said, creeps are usually guys. And while it's usually a guy crossing a line with a gal, the case of Jeffrey Dahmer breaks that pattern. A little. Dahmer was a creep, and a guy, but he only violated other men. And despite what I learned growing up, they weren't all gay men, nor were they all black men. In fact, the first two were white, the third was Native American. I believe the reason we remember the race and sexuality of the victims and why they were focused on by the 90s media was because even if they weren't the reason for his choice of victims, racism and homophobia absolutely enabled Dahmer's crimes. Everything about this man's pathetic life leads me to believe he was lazy and grabbed people right around him. At the establishments he frequented, people nearby that wouldn't pose much of a challenge. All he had to do was offer them some quick cash, 
just enough to pass the threshold of wariness they might have felt in going back to a random guy's apartment for the first time. There were probably times when I was dumb enough to do that as a kid that I would have felt the pull of a hundred bucks if the person offering knew all the right things to say. I'd like to pretend that I've always known better, but when I was a kid, who can say? That Milwaukee creep was committed. He had his game down. Dahmer only made enough money to fuel his bizarre hedonistic pursuits. He worked the graveyard shift at the chocolate factory so he could afford a shitty apartment in a bad part of town. Booze, cigarettes, pills, and drinks at the bars he frequented. It was all to collect men. Or really, things in the shapes of men. Realistic mannequins to roleplay with, because this was the closest he would ever come to establishing real human connections. At least this is the explanation we're given. Poor guy was messed up in the head from birth and lacked the ability to connect with other people. But I've always wondered how hard did he try? I wasn't there at the time, but it's also possible that he just turned people off over and over. And this convinced him that he was destined to strike out forever. And once he got the ball of murder rolling, after the first planned attack, he didn't even bother fighting the urges because they were irresistible. As an analogy, a lot of us use food to self-medicate. We eat too much and we gain weight. We can say things like, I tried as hard as possible to resist the urge, but I was powerless against it. But how hard are we really trying? Many of us convince ourselves that we are trying, and we trot out the old genetic or biological obstacle that we can point to. They're what's really holding me back. And hey, there's a pizza hut across the street. Let's continue this conversation over there, shall we? There's one great way to know if you're trying. The numbers on the scale. Underneath all of the explanations of why the numbers aren't changing, the process is self-evidently simple and brutally hard to execute, on the treadmill and at the dinner table. I diverted from Dahmer because we have a tendency to put the bad guys over there, in the bin of deplorables, safely away from normal people like us. They're practically a different species with the horrendous crimes they commit they would have to be. Their temptation must be different than ours. Yes, that feels better, less threatening to the old self-image. A tiger can't help wanting to tear you apart. A shark is just being a shark, but a human? We may hate someone and want to go tiger on them, but we can decide not to. The tiger can't do that. That decision, for the very rare person like the Milwaukee cannibal, may be as hard as it is for us fatties to go jogging really hard for an hour three times a week and not eat carbs. It's as if it's impossible. But really, it's just very hard. Dahmer told Stone Phillips that after his first intentional murder, he was helpless to resist. Helpless. Dahmer was very smart but did poorly in school because it was hard. He opted to drink whiskey all throughout the school day and do just enough work to go unnoticed. Mental conditions like his are serious, and because the evidence of his crimes is so graphic and hard to comprehend, we tend to accept that he's a monster and it is simply inevitable that these sickos will do what they're going to do, just like a shark. They are tempted by a desire too horrific for us to relate to in terms of its content, something in their nature and we assume that it's unavoidable. But is a drug addict predestined to return to drug use just because it's too hard to resist? We're told there's no way we can possibly understand these psychos, and we take great comfort in being able to just throw them in that box way over there. Before we proceed into the darkness of late 80s Milwaukee, we need to address a topic, and the topic is collecting. There's something inherently creepy about collecting. There just is. Men of the modern Western world tend to take certain boyish pastimes into our adulthoods, even if we try to keep it hush-hush and disguise it as a hobby. We graduate from collecting Star Wars figurines to acquiring watches, coins, vinyl records, even cars. Collecting isn't just a guy thing, but... Like most things guys do, we tend to go overboard to a level that transcends casual interest. We may use a collection as an opportunity to display specialized knowledge, or, in classic guy fashion, use it as a way to compete with other collectors of the same thing. 
In a sense, it's a conspicuous expression of prosperity, even waste. I don't need 10 cars, and that's exactly why I have 10 cars. Collecting has always existed throughout human history as a way to gather items and material that were scarce for future use. We are all here because people learned the power of collecting resources. But there are also power objects whose importance seems to be non-physical, but can be just as powerful for symbolic social creatures like humans and even our ancestors. I think I remember hearing Homo erectus buried their dead vertically and put objects in tombs and stuff. Our survival has required relationships and networking with others. And as such, we tend to assign physical objects with additional invisible importance, historical weight, religious power, familial meaning. Certain locations were, and still are, believed to hold meaning because of their connection with the history of bygone members of the human race. We make pilgrimages to an empty field because an important battle happened there, hundreds of years ago. We travel to lands with religious significance in hopes of feeling what some prophet may have felt, walking the same paths, hearing the same birds, smelling the same air. I'm not a religious believer, but even I have made pilgrimages to hometowns of several artists who contributed to my life through their music, writing, and art. Of course, they didn't know it, and that's part of the humanness of it. Their work is an encoding of their essence, through painting or music, and even when they're gone, it's providing a service to the rest of us. Maybe the most important service. You can have all your needs met, meat dried and stored in the cave for winter, but art gives us hope, and people who can afford it almost always collect art. Hmm. Connecting with creative works reminds us that there's something else going on here other than just the objects that ensure our survival. I don't think that has to be a god, but I understand the pull of that concept. I'd even like to see the Holy Lands of the Bible just to experience the places referenced so often in Western culture, which has roots in much older cultures. I'm trying to hit all my ancestral regions of Scandinavia, Ireland, and Germany at some point. Why? There's a certain satisfaction, if only psychological, of actually being there. Why should someone like me, who doesn't believe there's anything magical about these places, still benefit so much from that symbolic connection? A photo of a dead loved one, a letter, an heirloom, still brings security and even power. If I carry this letter into battle, it gives me confidence. Confidence may change the way I fight. I carry a lock of my loved one's hair in a dangerous journey, and I feel the essence of that person guiding me, even speaking to me. Objects. Power. Collection. The importance we imbue into objects is transparently phony on one side, but that doesn't seem to matter emotionally. I remember someone dropped their glasses at an art museum in a room of freeform sculptures. And by the time they came back to retrieve them, a crowd of people had formed around the glasses, and people were discussing the implications of the lonely spectacles, seemingly abandoned when they would have been so dearly needed. It's a statement about blindness, about why seeing clearly isn't necessarily freeing. It is better sometimes to see less. Then the person showed up, picked up the glasses, and left the museum. The people felt betrayed. By whom? by their own need to find meaning in just about everything we see, whether real or not. It's funny and absurd when it's shown so clearly as that example, but I absolutely don't think those people are silly for reading into those glasses, especially in the context of an art gallery. We deposit a loved one's ashes in a pond near where they first fell in love, and it's meaningful. This is how humans finalize. We give gifts that the other person doesn't need, but what it means is more important than what it does. In the 18th and 19th centuries, when perfume supposedly takes place, collections became a status symbol. Botanical and animal specimens, fossils or seashells organized on display cabinets became common in wealthy homes. Rare spirits, valuable antiques, even human body parts in bottles were not uncommon. Philanthropy is intertwined with collecting. Many personal collections are donated to museums, Proceeds of valuable collections can be donated to charitable organizations. This endowment effect is another reason why people collect things. They regard objects as having more value when they own more of them. Similarly, there's something called the contagion effect. 
the value collectors place on objects formerly owned by celebrities, sports heroes, world leaders. Collectors view the object as bringing some of the essence of its former owner. The idea that collections may have started as a survival mechanism gathering scarce items makes sense, but I think of this line from the 40-year-old virgin when they're talking about letting Steve Carell's character Andy, who has this massive toy collection, possibly hanging out with them. The guy says, I don't want to end up a lampshade in some creepy apartment. And it's funny because it's universal to find unnecessary collecting kind of creepy. Killers almost always men, take souvenirs so they can rewind to that moment when they, you know. When we left off with Jeffrey D., he was bringing a mannequin to Grandma's. She found the object unnerving and got rid of it. So this lonely weirdo started bringing real men home. Since high school, he had kept his fantasies of lying next to an inanimate man secret. He said once these images crept into his waking thoughts, combining with his fascination with dissected animals, from then on his inner thoughts were basically unshareable. I can see why he was called the world's loneliest man, even if joking, and I do feel sympathy for him and others who live with this affliction, whatever it is. Loneliness is known to kill older people. However, I don't buy it as an excuse for what he did next. See, Jeff got his system down. Luring men to his house with the promise of money, drinking, sex, and then drugging and killing them. Simple. The spider laid out his web, passively waited for the prey to walk in, immobilized them, waiting, then extracted what he needed. He repeated the process several times at Grandma's house and then at the Oxford Apartments, his final lair. The details of his crimes are all over the internet, documentaries, and so out of respect for the victims, I'm skipping over those. Why he did what he did is interesting to me. I don't need to lay out all the salacious details like a thriller, where the victims are just bodies. Jeff had become a collector of men, just like Jean-Baptiste was a collector of women. Dahmer kept trophies from his victims so he could replay their romantic time together. That's really how he looked at it, too. He saw their contact as having sacred importance to him, and as such, he had drawn up details of a plan for the Jeffrey Dahmer altar, complete with the painted skulls of his little congregation, like you and I might save a box of love notes to look at every 10 years. Power objects became the main focus of these weak men's lives, one in Paris, one in Wisconsin. Just like our perfume protagonist, Dahmer claims to have never enjoyed harming the men, that it was just a means to an end. A psychopath places no more value in a human life than that of a vegetable. No guilt, no regret, because the sacrifice was for a purpose, just like ripping out a tree to put up a fence. This was always the way the story was told. I doubt this, though. Dahmer's last victim, Tracy, who survived his attempted collection, said that the creep was whispering to him quietly as he laid his head lovingly on Tracy's chest, listening to his heartbeat. Tracy asked him what he was doing, and Jeff casually said, I'm listening because I'm going to eat it. And why would he say that if he didn't take pleasure in terrifying this poor guy? I wonder if Jeff wasn't just narrating, not with the intent of taunting the guy, but still I don't buy it. I think he drank to dull his guilt because he knew he was evil because he wasn't actually a spider. He took, took, took from better men because he knew what he really was, empty. This is a perfect time to share the first stanza of The Spider and the Fly, an 1829 poem by Mary Howitt. You'll see why. Will you walk into my parlor? Said the spider to the fly. Tis the prettiest little parlor that ever you did spy. The way into my parlor is up a winding stair. And I have many pretty things to show when you are there. Oh, no, no, said the little fly. To ask me is in vain, for who goes up your winding stair can ne'er come down again. In perfume, Jean-Baptiste similarly lived for himself, but as he had no family or loved ones, he truly was living for himself alone. He gave nothing to the world. He preferred to get out of everyone else's way to go unnoticed. Grenouille, unlike Dahmer, is an artistic virtuoso. 
it's hard not to admire that type of talent, even despite its source. If someone, an artist for example, commits some horrible act, but also happens to be a genius, I will not forgive them, but simultaneously stand in awe of their talent. I may also decide not to support their career, if they're still alive, with my money. As far as I know, that's how the free market works. I will usually still listen to someone's music, watch their movies, even if they did something horrible, unless the art they're producing reminds me of what they did. We all contribute to this complex by benefiting from engineering marvels that may have violent and disturbing connections. We'll still work in those buildings or take those bridges while acknowledging history is real. A lot of us are hypocrites anyway, eating meat and using iPhones despite knowing how they came to be in our pockets. We don't have meat in our pockets, but you know. In this system, someone's got to pay for others to receive, and yes, it's absolutely unfair. For example, I think vegans who avoid all animal products for ethical reasons are actually better than me in that realm. I'll admit it. I think as long as it's wrong to kill people, it's probably wrong to kill animals, too, for food. But I recognize that there are different levels of wrong. And I think vegans who have taken on that experiment living as close to a cruelty-free life as possible will be seen by future generations as superior to people like me. I have always felt guilty about this cruelty. And I have a theory that most of us walk around subconsciously aware of our transgressions, a little one here, another there, and accumulating guilt about them. I know I do. We take part in the dark and light of being alive. We pay a cost. Light and Dark We will consume dumb comedies and slasher films alike because they all shine a light on us. They show us how weird we are and also how full of love. We can only hope that the good we do for each other will outweigh or at least balance the bad. That's my hope. You will do good because you are good. In one of his last interviews, Kurt Cobain cited Perfume, The Story of a Murderer, as his favorite book noting that he had read it about ten times. If ever there was a mixture of light and dark, it can be found in the art of people like this, who accept both fear and love, and try, as hard as it can be, to do good. Fuck it, let's do good. Don't be scared. Subscribe to Season 1 for free in your podcast app. Then, be scared. 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 Scared.